Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Electricity Association's 2021 Spring Policy Symposium. Bonjour à tous et bienvenue à l'édition printanière du Symposium sur les politiques 2021 de l'Association canadienne de l'électricité. Je suis Francis Bradley, le PDG de l'Association canadienne de l'électricité. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands, which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all of the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. D'un océan à l'autre, nous reconnaissons que nous exerçons nos activités sur le territoire ancestral non cédé de tous les Inuits, Métis, et membres des Premières Nations. I would now like to offer a moment of reflection for the 215 children who were discovered at a Kamloops residential school last month. May we continue to learn and grow from these atrocities as we grapple with our country's difficult and recent history. Thank you. Well, it's certainly been a long 16 months. Just last year, we were only beginning to understand the impact of COVID-19 on the entire world. Now we have uh, several successful vaccines in a country that's more than 60% partially inoculated. Modern medicine and technology are truly astounding. It goes without saying this virus has influenced every aspect of our lives. However, one thing it didn't impact is our access to reliable electricity. Now, that's not to say that our industry wasn't affected significantly. We were, and we still are. But the Canadians working and going to school from home, the industries making millions of masks and the grocery stores providing essential food to customers did not experience any service disruptions as of COVID-19. This service continuity was not lucky. It was, in fact, years in building and rebuilding a newer and smarter grid. And it was years of engaging a highly skilled workforce and preparing for the unpredictable from tornadoes to wildfires to cyber attacks. I could not have predicted that a virus would be included on this list. However, we're a resilient sector. We're ready to continue to build for a future that will bring more unpredictability. Today, we want to shift our focus to the next crisis our industry is facing and society is facing, the climate crisis. We've brought in some very exciting speakers to talk about climate adaptation and resiliency. And we have an executive panel at the end of our agenda to discuss environmental and social responsibility. I'm really looking forward to today's discussions. Nous accueillons aujourd'hui d'éminents conférenciers qui vous parleront d'adaptation au changement climatique et de résilience. Pour clore le symposium, un groupe de PDG discuteront de la responsabilité environnementale et sociale. J'ai vraiment hâte d'entendre tous ces invités. Before we get started, I want to congratulate one of our members, Newfoundland Power, on receiving the Sustainable Electricity Brand designation. This distinguished designation means that Newfoundland Power is fully integrating sustainability into their operations. They are demonstrating continuous improvement and confidence from the public in their actions. I want to congratulate the staff who worked with CEA and the independent auditors to examine their operations and to ensure they're making every effort to move their organization in the right direction. You know, Newfoundland Power is the 10th member company to receive this designation. We're encouraged by the member uptake of the Sustainable Electricity Brand designation because when there's confidence in this utility, there is confidence in this sector. Je cède maintenant la parole à Mike Marsh, président directeur général de Sask Power et président du conseil d'administration de l'OCE. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Francis. I want to echo uh, what you said. Well, surely we're all looking forward to getting together in person 
the true resilience and adaptation that our sector has demonstrated over the past year is truly re remarkable. Our workers have taken extraordinary actions at home and in the field to deliver reliable and safe electricity for all Canadians. Thank you to CEA for organizing a terrific afternoon with a lineup of great conversations. The conversations range from climate resiliency and adaptation to the state of reliability in Texas and financing electrical infrastructure. We have a panel of distinguished CEOs that will discuss their organization's environmental, social and corporate governance and how these initiatives will help them lead down the path to net zero by 2050. With that, I would like to give a special welcome to today's distinguished keynote speakers. We are grateful to be joined by Nobel Peace Prize nominee and environmental, cultural and human rights advocate, Sheila Watt Cloutier, head of Intact Center on Climate Adaptation from the Faculty of Environment, at University of Waterloo, Dr. Blair Feltmate, and the president and CEO of the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, Mr. Jim Robb. But first, we have been joined by the Minister of Natural Resources to say a few words. Minister O'Regan was appointed Minister of Natural Resources in 2019 with a mandate to put Canada's natural resource sectors at the forefront of the fight against climate change. This mandate includes planting 2 billion trees over the next 10 years, developing low and zero emission fuels for widespread adoption, and retrofitting homes and infrastructure to ensure peak energy efficiency. The Minister is here to share an important update on an initiative affecting our sector. Over to you, Minister O'Regan. Good afternoon, everyone. Je vous parle depuis l'île de Terre-Neuve, la terre ancestrale des peuples Mi'kmaq et Biafuk. And let me start by congratulating the Canadian Electricity Association on a milestone, your 130th anniversary. You have grown and evolved over 130 years. You have innovated and built. You have brought power to Canadians. And now you're leading on climate change. You've lowered emissions more than any other sector, 30% since 2005. And this symposium builds on that record with a focus on reliability, and resiliency, renewing infrastructure, and modernizing electricity systems and grids. And we share these goals. Our smart grid program and our emerging renewable power program share these goals. You know these programs well. And they've both generated more interest actually than we can handle. These programs will increase the use of renewable generation, improve reliability, resiliency, and system flexibility. They'll create jobs and lower emissions, and that's what it's all about. So we've turned to the best to lead these initiatives, you. Your members are breaking down barriers to commercialization in the private sector and helping utilities adopt new technologies. In Lac Magantic, for example, we're working with Hydro-Quebec and the community to sustainably revitalize its downtown by building a microgrid that leverages batteries, solar panels, and electric vehicle charging stations for a more resilient grid. In New Brunswick, where your members continue to win awards, like St. John Energy winning the 2021 International Award of Excellence announced at the Clean Energy Ministerial earlier this month. And in Saskatchewan, where the Deep Earth Energy Production Project is figuratively and literally breaking new ground in Canada, set to generate five megawatts and power 5,000 homes. I joined CEA's regulatory forum just a few weeks ago to take the next big step, launching the Smart Renewables and Electrification Pathways Program, or SREPS for short. $964 million over four years for smart renewables and grid modernization to get us to net zero by lowering emissions from our electricity system, increasing renewables on the grid, increasing reliability and resiliency, and improving the data that we get from the grid, helping analysts and researchers do their jobs. It's how we build back better, more sustainably, more inclusively. It's designed to bring down the barriers to participation for those underrepresented in the energy sector, including women, gender diverse people, racialized communities, persons with disabilities, and indigenous peoples. We are at a pivotal moment. There are significant changes happening in this industry, changes that reshape the way that we produce, move, and use energy. And we are right there with you, innovating, NRCAN is home to several of the world's leading laboratories conducting R&D, supporting a range of electrification pathways to net zero in Canada, but one thing will remain constant. The CEA will continue leading the way. The ingenuity and determination of your members will keep powering the Canadian economy, keeping all our lights on, 
making sure Canadians can lead prosperous, comfortable lives. It's critical work. And it's how we double down on what I like to call our common mission, net zero emissions by 2050, a prosperous economy that continues to create good jobs and a low carbon future that leaves no one behind. I know that's a lot. I know it's ambitious, but we're Canada. It's what we do. I wish you a very successful symposium. Good afternoon. My name is Roger D'Antoni and I'm the president and CEO of Fortis BC. Thank you to Sheila Watt Cloutier for her keynote address today. Through Sheila's comments, we were able to reimagine the future and better understand how climate change is linked to human rights. Sheila, I appreciated how you took the larger issue of climate change and built a narrative we can all relate to as members of different communities. Our organizations are constantly striving to do their part, both for the climate and communities. Conversations like these remind us why we make the business decisions that we do. Thank you again, Sheila. I'd now like to turn things over to Dr. Blair Feltman, who will continue with the theme of climate change and speak more specifically about adaptation. Blair is the head of the Intac Center on Climate Adaptation at the University of Waterloo. Previous positions he has held include Vice President of Sustainable Development at the Bank of Montreal and Director of Sustainable Development at Ontario Power Generation. Blair is also a member of the Sustainable Finance Advisory Council at the Global Risk Institute. He is chair of the Adaptation Committee at the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, and is also on the advisory board for climate change with the Minister of Environment in Ontario. He is a former chair of Pollution Probe and of the Sustainable Electricity Program at the Canadian Electricity Association. Blair will be joined by my colleague on the CEA Board of Directors, Vinay Sharma, President and CEO of London Hydro to dive deeper into a conversation on the utility's role in climate adaptation. Vinay joined London Hydro back in 1998 as an engineer and has served in several different roles with the utility. Before becoming CEO back in 2009, Vinay was Vice President of Strategic Planning and Customer Services. I hope you enjoy Blair's presentation on climate change adaptation and his corresponding conversation with Vinay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger, and I'm certainly pleased to be here to talk about climate adaptation and resiliency, or in other words, when extreme climate change events happen along the lines of that which you see depicted in these pictures, uh, too much water in the wrong place causing flooding at the community level and down to the individual house, as you see in the upper left-hand corner, or we have fires impacting homes and communities and businesses in forested regions, or we may have high winds taking down uh, power lines. I'm going to first describe the, the growing costs associated with these types of events that are occurring with increasing uh, frequency across Canada. And I'll then describe how Canada is preparing for these events through the creation of new adaptation guidelines and standards. Then we'll finish by focusing on two key areas where the CEA and member companies can make a substantial contribution to limiting flood risk at the national level. And this is important, focusing on flood risk, considering that flooding is the number one climate cost impacting Canada right now by far. So that's where we're heading. And, and by the way, uh, all of the material I present complements well the excellent guide the CEA has produced under the title of Climate Change in Extreme Weather, a Guide to Adaptation Planning. So that's where we're heading. And just to add a little bit more meat to the bone in reference to where we're heading here, um, I'm first going to start out by just documenting the fact that the costs of climate change and extreme weather risk are going up uh, uh, across the country. I'm then going to turn to new Canadian standards and guidelines that are have been and continue to be developed to mitigate, in particular, flood risk in the country. And we're only going to focus on flooding because we don't have time to consider other perils, but we've also advanced, developed good standards and guidelines to mitigate other forms of extreme weather risk, such as fires. And then I'm going to end up, uh, as I mentioned before, by focusing on two areas where the CEA can play a, a, a key role to limit uh, flood risk in the country going forward. Now, just to make sure we're all on the, the same page, and I think we are, um, it is important to note that climate change has happened, is happening, and will continue to happen. And we are up more or less right now on, on a planetary basis, about 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer today on the planet than was the case a little over 100 years ago. 
And that increase in temperature is directly attributable to the burning of fossil fuels. And this isn't my cavalier opinion. This is the opinion expressed by many credible organizations around the world, including uh, uh, this group on the upper part of the slide, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where as far back as 2014, and it even goes before that, they said uh, uh, it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. Uh, that warming is the being 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer. Uh, and with more warmth in the system, we get more extreme weather because there's simply more energy in the system now as occurred prior to the Industrial Revolution and the burning of fossil fuels. And, um, and again, they, they make it quite clear that it is burn, the burning of fossil fuels that is the causal mechanism. On a geological time scale, lots of things have influenced climate change on a planetary basis. But in the short term of the last 100 years, it is purely the burning of fossil fuels. And then more recently, in towards the bottom half of the slide, we have a report called Canada's Changing Climate Report uh, 2019, which was authored by about 10 climate scientists from Environment Canada, where they made the point that, um, and I'll, I'll read the words in italics, is taken directly from the report, they say Canada's climate has warmed and will warm further in the future, driven by human influence, and this warming is effectively irreversible. And this is the first time, at least that I'm aware of, at a national level, that the federal government has documented that uh, we're not going backwards on climate change. And indeed, this is also accepted internationally. Climate change is here to stay. And by the way, that doesn't mean that we should, shouldn't be doing everything within our power to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, to lower the rate of change. But we have to accept the fact that climate change um, has occurred and will continue to occur. And as a result of that, we will, we will realize more extreme weather going forward. Therefore, it underscores the need to adapt to extreme weather event. Uh, that, the extreme weather that's on the ground today and the more extreme weather that's coming in the future. So I really want to underscore that point that Adaptation is, 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 is paramount. Now, turning to the costs being realized uh, due to climate change, what you're looking at on this chart is along the x-axis is uh, time, obviously, from 1983 up to, up to and including 2020, and on the y-axis, uh, dollars paid out in billions of dollars. And this data documents the catastrophic loss insurable claims uh, paid out in Canada over this uh, time frame. And, uh, and in insurance terms, a catastrophic event is any event like a flood, fire, hailstorm, windstorm, whatever it might be. If it triggers more than $25 million in claims, it gets captured uh, in, in terms of the data on this, this chart. And this work is carried out by the Insurance Bureau of Canada and CAT IQ and uh, different organizations. All the data presented on this chart before I describe it um, I would like you to note that it's all the data has been corrected to $2,020 corrected for inflation and four per capita wealth accumulation. In other words, if you were insuring twice as many homes today as was the case 10 years ago, you would expect that with nothing going on, the, the insurance claims would be twice as high. So that has been factored out of this data so that horizontally we're looking at a comparison of apples to apples. And what's notable here is that from the period of 1983 up to about 2008, the insurance industry in Canada could pound, count on paying out between about 250 to $450 million per year in catastrophic loss claims. But things started to change on or about 2009 onward, whereby for 11 out of the last 12 years, the catastrophic loss claims have gone over a billion dollars per year, every year for 11 out of the last 12 years, for an average cost of about 1.8 to $1.9 billion. And the culprit that's driving uh, uh, disproportionately the, these increasing costs, this upward bend in the curve, is too much water in the wrong place, flooding. Flooding is, is the number one cost, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, for the country, and particularly residential basement flooding, basements flooding for detached, semi-detached, and, and row housing uh, in the country. And the... And that is attributable to uh, storms of greater in intensity, frequency, uh, magnitude that are occurring in the country, but not solely to that. It's also attributable to uh, loss of natural infrastructure in the country. 
The forest fields and wetlands that were originally here are increasingly so, particularly across the southern region of Canada, uh, disappearing. We've lost over the period of the last 100 years about, on average, uh, through the southern regions of provinces in the country where most of us, most of us live, about 60 to 80 percent of the natural infrastructure that was originally here over 100 years ago, it's now gone, the forest fields and wetlands. When it is there or was there, it gives water a place to go when the big storms hit and stay on the landscape for a long period of time and discharge slowly downstream or into the groundwater system. But uh, with the loss of natural infrastructure being replaced by pavement or agricultural development, the water tends to not stay on the landscape for very long. It flows off very, very discharges quickly to the, the lowest place around, which quite often can be somebody's basement. So it's a combination of bigger storms combined with loss of natural infrastructure, combined with aging infrastructure, combined with aging at the, at the municipal level and or the individual house level that, that's affecting the upward bend in the curve here. So remember this point that it's uh, it's uh, flooding at the house level and loss of natural infrastructure that are two big contributors to this phenomena because those are the two points I'm going to drill down to uh, as to where the CEA can make a contribution to mitigate uh, extreme weather risk in the country going forward. And by the way, parenthetically, just to underscore the severity of this challenge just for housing in the country alone, um, as a result of what you see on the screen, in home insurance premiums have increased 20 to 25% in Canada over the last five years. 60% of that increase is attributable to, to water and flooding basements. We have an increase in the percentage of homes in Canada that are uh, uninsurable relative to weather-induced flood risk, uh, basement flooding, and that extends from uh, Halifax to uh, Victoria. The cap rates that insurers are putting on uh, coverage for basement flooding are coming down all the time now uh, into the range, more into the range of 10 to $20,000 maximum uh, coverage for basement flooding. With the average cost of basement flooding being about $43,000 in the country uh, per house, uh, that gap in insurance coverage is big. And by the way, all the data presented on this chart uh, is, re reflects the insurable losses to say nothing of that which is uninsurable. For every $1 in insurable loss, there's about three to $4 in uninsurable losses realized. So I just really wanted to paint the picture here of the, 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 the severity of the challenge in the system. And uh, now the question is, what are we doing about it? And again, I'm just going to zero in on flood risk here. In Canada, we, we haven't been sitting on our hands in preparing for flood risk. Over the past five years, uh, we've done a lot of work to develop standards and guidelines to identify practical, meaningful, and cost-effective ways to mitigate flood risk. And the we here is, is a big we. It's the National Research Council, it's the Standards Council of Canada, it's the Canadian Standards Association. I like to think the uh, INTAC Centre is uh, quite involved in the creation of the standards and guidelines you see on the, on, on the screen here. And really, for every document that I will very briefly describe, uh, there's about 60 to 80 groups, professional groups that come together to figure out how do we mitigate flood risk at the various levels that you see um, um, identified per, per each document here. Uh, the CEA, by the way, is, is prominently involved in, in the development of uh, uh, many of these standards. And just uh, by way of what they cover, uh, starting in the upper left-hand corner and then going uh, counterclockwise, we've developed good guidance for the country on how to mitigate risk at the level of the individual home. What can you do around the outside of the property and the basement itself to lower the chances you'll end up with a flooded basement? We have new guidance, good guidance on how to build new residential communities going forward in such a way that when the big storms hit, everybody doesn't flood out. And that starts with, by the way, not building on a floodplain. Uh, we know what to do for existing communities uh, to, to identify areas that are high risk of flooding and then measures that can be taken or put in place to mitigate flood risk using berms, diversion channels, holding ponds, cisterns, uh, permeable surfacing, natural infrastructure uh, put in place. At the level of commercial real estate, we have good guidance now on how to lower the probability that we'll have underground parking lots filled with water. We have good guidance on how to maintain and on, on the need to retain and restore natural infrastructure on the landscape to mitigate flood risk. Good guidance for that is uh, will be developed in about two, released in about two months from now 
to deal with uh, coastline resiliency for Canada's east and west coast, the Atlantic and the Pacific, to deal with uh, storm surge, uh, sea level rise, and king tides. And by the way, the only thing that's missing from the equation now that will be developed uh, within about two years is a new resiliency standard for the uh, shorelines of the, the Great Lakes in Canada. Um, and then the works of all of these documents, if anybody's interested in seeing the short form of it, it has been encapsulated in the report in the center that puts the key findings from all reports into one-stop shopping called Under One Umbrella. So I just wanna briefly mention uh, for the home report in the upper left-hand corner and the natural infrastructure report in the lower right-hand corner, there's a significant role for the CEA to play. So this is where I'm heading in the last uh, couple of minutes here. And just concentrate on the right-hand side of the slide for the moment. Let me describe what you're looking at, and then I'll explain it within the context of uh, uh, the contribution the CEA can make or member companies. What we have developed based on extensive work of, of what you can do at the level of a house to mitigate flood risk, ending up with a basement full of water, we've developed a simple infographic that is being distributed en masse now across the country that on with three lows, rows of, of documentation, the first row uh, of five factors uh, on the right-hand side of the screen identifies actions that can be taken around a house for, for zero money that are very simple, that can very much lower the probability that someone ends up with a flooded basement. And these actions can be as simple as, for example, and I won't describe them all, but you'll, you'll see how infinitesimally simple some of these things are. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, just an action taken in communities to, to, in the spring and the fall, make sure that leaves and other forms of blockage are removed from sewer grates to make it such that if a big storm hits, water can flow into the sewer grate and, and safely discharge away as opposed to if it's blocked and a big storm hits, water builds up in the street and may flow into people's basements. Two or three years ago in Guelph, a small town in Southern Ontario, uh, a major storm hit in the fall, uh, about 80 millimeters of rain came down over a six hour period. The sewer grates were largely blocked, nobody had cleared them. And as a result of that, we had about 30 to $35 million in basement flooding occur, damage occur that could have been avoided if we had simply opened up the sewer grates. Um, on the fourth box over in the top row, it can be actions can be as simple as uh, ensuring that your sub pump works. If you have a sub pump in a sump well in the basement, a place where water can collect uh, in the basement and then safely, and then that water get you know, pumped outside if indeed your basement fills with water, uh, you want to pour a bucket of water in that sump well just to see does the sump pump work? Does it turn on? Does it pump the water outside? Many people find out the first time that their sub pump doesn't work when they have three and a half feet of sewer water in their basement, which is not the situation you want to be in. Um, the second row down, and again, I'll just hit one or two points here. The first box in the, uh, uh, on the left on the second row, uh, you can install plastic covers over window wells to make it such that when the big storms hit, the water doesn't fill the window well and subsequently flow into the basement. And you can put a plastic cover in over a window well for about $40. Um, on the uh, bottom row, in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, when I mentioned a, a sub pump earlier, you also want to make sure that for the sub pump, you have battery backup supply. Because very often, and the people on this call don't, don't need uh, you know, any special information on this point, but very often, when the time you need the sub pump is when the big storms hit. And quite often, when the big storms hit, the electricity can go out. So the time you need your sub pump to work may be at a time uh, uh, that, that the electricity isn't available. Therefore, you want to make sure that you have a back battery backup supply attached to the sub pump that can run the pump for one to three days just in case there's an electricity outage. And the kit to put a sub pump in place is only about uh, $200 to $250. And again, remember, with the average cost of basement flooding in the country being $43,000, these simple actions that can be executed on a weekend without special expertise for a very small sum of money, this is a pretty good investment. And what we're doing now, so that's just a descriptor of this guidance. That guidance is now being distributed in various forms across the country to homeowners. When this information is put into the hands of homeowners, we know that six months later, the average homeowner will have operationalized at least two of these measures they will have been put in place that they wouldn't have otherwise done simply if they weren't aware of these actions that they can take. 
Companies like Energy Plus, which is a local distribution company in uh, Southern Ontario, they're now distributing this material, this infographic, uh, with their electricity bills or their hydro bills directly to customers. Um, we have other organizations, uh, such as the Insurance uh, Brokers uh, Association of Canada, I'm on the left-hand side of the slide now, they're distributing this material to homeowners. The Canadian Real Estate Association and real estate agents and brokers are distributing this information to their, 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 their client base. Mortgage Professionals Canada are distributing it, the Canadian Credit Union Association, and multiple towns and counties across the country are now using this infographic, including it in property tax notices or your tax bills, uh, which people have to open. They can't dismiss that as junk mail. They have to open the material, and there is this, is this simple guidance on how to protect your home from basement flooding. And I would say this is one major action. I would certainly like to see the Canadian Electricity Association as a whole, and whether you're a generation company, transmission, or distribution, distribute this information in the communities in which you operate. Get it into the hands of homeowners. And for those in the electricity sector, amongst other points, you don't want basement flooding. You don't want somebody walking into a basement and protect and 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 potentially being electrocuted. So it's it's just it's good for everybody to get this hands out this information into the hands of homeowners. And then finally, another area that I had mentioned on the opening slides is that that which is contributing to flood risk and the increasing cost of flood risk in the country is the loss of natural infrastructure the forests and fields and the wetlands that were originally here. We've done a, quite a bit of research in the WE meeting, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, the Intac Centre, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, where we have uh, identified very clearly through experimental work that having natural infrastructure upstream of built up areas, uh, well, they can be urban or rural areas, that when you have natural infrastructure upstream of areas, of uh, urban or rather suburban in nature, and a big storm hits, the cost savings by having natural infrastructure upstream uh, are in the order of about 29 to 38% of total cost savings of damage that now doesn't occur when you have natural infrastructure in place, as opposed to if you have, in, the, in a colloquialism, everything paved over. So one of the mandates we were working on embracing for the country, and this is really drawing a lot of attention in the last, uh, I would say, year to 18 months, relative to natural infrastructure and flood risk mitigation, is first of all, let's retain what we have. Let's stop losing, to the greatest degree possible, the natural infrastructure that still remains. Number two is restore what we've lost. And number three is, relative to flood, flood risk mitigation, build what we must, using natural and built infrastructure to mitigate flood risk. For the Canadian Electricity Association, I would say a direction could be relative to natural infrastructure, work to retain and restore natural infrastructure on your personal lands, the lands under your, your direct control. And then number two, work more broadly with uh, local NGOs, conservation authorities, Ducks Unlimited, Others within the communities in which you operate who have, have, have expertise in the area of retaining and restoring natural infrastructure, partner with them uh, to, to, to bring natural infrastructure into play. And in so doing, you will mitigate flood risk at the community level, which again, benefits, uh, uh, it provides a benefit whether you're a generation, transmission, or distribution organization. So I'll leave it at that. And, um, and I thank you for your attention. Uh, just in 2017, March, uh, our, our, one of our substations was flooded, and we abandoned that substation since then. But when I look at your uh, presentation, uh, and you mentioned in your slide deck that uh, climate change is now irreversible. And uh, today, I'm not sure if you uh, actually yesterday, uh, a news came out from World Meteorological Organization that in next five years, it is confirmed that our temperature will rise 1.5 degree above pre-industrialized uh, period, which is basically reinforces your idea about that this is irreversible. So let's work to adapt to this new reality, and which, uh, uh, which I really appreciate from your slide deck that I 
now firmly believe we have to learn to adapt uh, to this. Now, the question that I have for you is, like utilities, you can appreciate face a uh, three-dimensional challenge. One, in these uh, new change condition, we have to make our infrastructure resilient because enhance reliability, protect our assets. And then lastly, which I really appreciate you brought up, that we also have a role to play in educating our customers. And I think time has come for us to be more active in that role because so far we have been focused on energy management issues and reducing and uh, using less or being more efficient. But now we have to look at how we can educate our customers. So can you share with me some thoughts uh, in addition to the pamphlet that you shared with us in your slide deck, what else can utilities do to educate our customers so their uh, houses and the places they work at become more resilient and adapt to these uh, flood situations? Well, one of the things I would like to see, and it kind of builds on the theme I just presented, you're well familiar with Interguide Canada and, and direction there to, to uh, where people can apply and have someone arrive at their house to give them guidance on how to make their home more energy efficient. And there will be subsidies that would be available to them in that regard for an energy efficient furnace or, or, or more energy efficient windows or insulation and attics and so forth. And that's all good. I'm a big fan of that. But what we're also doing and hoping for and, and any reinforcement in this regard that can come from the electricity sector would be well appreciated. Also, with that person who arrives at your home to do the energy efficiency analysis, I think what we also want to do is have that person similarly trained to do a visual inspection of the outside of the property and then in the basement itself, why they're there. What are your key vulnerabilities at the level of the house relative to basement flooding? And uh, with a person who has sufficiently advanced technical expertise to do an energy efficiency analysis, it's very simple. It's much simpler, quite frankly, to do the visual inspection of key factors that can affect basement flooding. And so therefore we can have someone in one stop shopping, one person show up one time and do both energy efficiency and flood resiliency for the home and deliver that report to the homeowner. The degree to which uh, 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 the membership of CA, CEA or, uh, uh, could, could help put even more pressure on Interguide or Intercan to, to follow through on this, I think that would be tremendously useful. Yes, yes, indeed, Blair. Right? You know, and you mentioned uh, CEA's report on climate change and extreme weather, a guide to adaptive planning for electrical companies. It has quite an extensive process for the utilities, uh, for CEA members uh, and others to adapt uh, their infrastructure planning for flood-like situation and other extreme weather situation. I guess uh, what you're proposing in your slide deck is that utilities, time has come for us now to start working and educating our customers in a very comprehensive manner to protect their uh, place of residence against all climate change impacts, including flood. We cannot just consider energy only as the only issue for us to educate our customers. I guess we have to take all around approach because we are a community player. And you can appreciate utilities are much closer to their customers than in many other businesses per se. And uh, so it behooves us more that we take more interest in their well-being as well. You agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And and even, by the way, even in the operations of utilities themselves, whether it's generation, transmission, and distribution, uh, one of the misnomers that is out there, in my opinion at least, is that adaptation is always expensive. But when you're building new, for example, the first, or you have a scheduled retrofit, very often, uh, it costs more or less the same to build something right under the umbrella of adaptation than to build it wrong. But if you build it wrong and then have to subsequently retrofit to build it the way you should have built in the first time, let's say to mitigate flood risk and or fire risk or other perils, it's enormously expensive. So uh, if you're building a new facility in a location, you want to make sure that you've looked at not just the current flood risk maps, but future projections, for example, of flood risk, to mm -hmm. that you're not building today in an area that it may be safe today, but 25 years from now, it may you, the, the structure may come into harm's way relative to flooding. Because when we build large physical infrastructures, 
we're talking about capital stock turnover that's 25, 50, 75 years from now. It's going to be there for a long time. So it costs more or less the same amount of money to build in the right place versus the wrong place. So let's build right. right. And the thing, by the way, about adaptation to remember that different that gives it, in my opinion, a slight uh, advantage over mitigation is that when you're mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, the benefits of that uh, reduction accrue to the global commons. You're kind of hoping if you mitigate your greenhouse gas emissions, everybody else is doing the same thing around the world. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people say, well, why should we do this if China or India or Russia or whoever else is not doing it? But on adaptation, every dollar you spend on adaptation, the benefits accrue locally. Yes. Yes. Build a larger diameter sewer drainage pipe in, in your neighborhood. You get those benefits in your neighborhood dollar for dollar. And the other thing about adaptation to remember is that it's the gift that keeps on giving. Once you build it right, not only do you save the next time the extreme weather event occurs, but you save the time after that, the time after that, and the time after that. So sometimes people say to me, what's the return on investment for adaptation? And so you give me the time frame, and I'll give you the return because it's a gift that keeps on giving. Yes. Now, Blair, you said you hit the nail here, return on investment. I have, we have seen that, that all these uh, new innovative ideas, like the one you just are suggesting here, adds value to you. And, you know, utilities are these days involved in a lot of net zero energy development communities. And here at Linden, we are also involved in West 5 uh, development unta- undertaken by Sifton. And uh, we will see these benefits, even though there is a it seems at least there is a fear of there's a large investment required, but I think long run, there's a large return on investment from these. And now, uh, Blair, uh, you know, this is a wonderful chat uh, and uh, I'm cl- coming to sort of closing this chat. But before I do, I like to have uh, a couple of last comments from you. And one of them being is, uh, you know, as you are sharing with us, we have to learn to live in balance with the nature and utilities have to broaden their service scope to their customers, including such advice as you shared with us, protecting your properties against flood. And uh, leaders, uh, you have to have a message for our leaders also, because in Ontario, as you know, green belt sometimes is under uh, some pressure uh, because governments and developers want to develop. So what's your message to uh, leaders uh, of utilities as well as of governments? The bottom line, and in my opinion, the most formidable challenge in reference to climate change and preparing for extreme weather risk in Canada going forward is complacency. I don't think as a country, we understand the need to act with a sense of urgency to prepare for the extreme weather risk, not just of today, but that which is coming. Every single day that we don't adapt is a day we do not have. So it is in our best interest to act with, 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 with haste immediately to build adaptation into the system. That's great, Blair. I thank you for sharing this uh, time with uh, with us. And uh, I'm sure your other members will find your talk very informative. And uh, I sincerely, sincerely enjoy talking to you, Blair. uh, The the same in reverse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Climate adaptation is essentially the impact that the environment is having on us and what we're going to do about it. Canada's climate is warming, and that means we're getting a lot more extreme weather events, uh, for one thing, and that can stress out the electricity system. So climate change adaptation is how we're changing the way that we do things in order to protect the system and ensure that we can keep doing what we do, delivering power to Canadians. Uh, We've had wildfires in 
um, uh, in various places in Canada. Fort McMurray suffered a, a major, a major uh, wildfire a few years ago. There's been ice storms that have affected electricity infrastructure and floods as well. Electricity is, the system is out there. You know, it's on wires, it's on poles, it's it's above ground, it's quite exposed uh, when, you, uh, when you think about it. And that means it's subject to all the forces of nature that, um, that are happening around it. This latest offering that we have is a guidance document that outlines in really specific ways for the folks that are designing the system, building the system, and essentially trying to pay for that as well. Ad assess the risks that are posed by climate change and the environment on that system and what to do about it. What are the, what the best ways that they can allocate their resources, which are scarce, to solve the problem, to make sure that to the best of their ability, when the power is needed, they can still deliver it, even if there is an extreme weather event. The electricity system is going through a massive transformation right now as we speak. Really now is the time to look at what kind of risks there exist on these on these systems and what we can do about it. There have been numerous studies that have looked at how much actually does it cost to make sure that things are resilient before something happens. And it's at the low end, it's nine times less expensive to do something proactively before you need to do it. So before that wildfire comes in to knock out your transmission system, to ensure or to do what you can to make it resilient to wildfire, it's nine times cheaper to do that than to wait for it and then rebuild it afterwards. The federal government's committed to reaching a goal of, of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And this is going to be um, a major initiative that's gonna be driving how the electricity sector invests and what it's going to be doing over the next 30 years. Electricity is so important to that goal because as fossil fuels will be used less, electricity needs to be there to make up for the shortfall. So we're going to be electrifying things that used to be fossil fuel powered, like transportation, like some industrial processes. And that means electricity and making sure that, it's, that the electricity system is reliable is going to be even more important going forward. As we're dealing with the change in climate, as things are getting hotter, and people are, are going to be looking to electricity to provide that low carbon energy to help them get through their day. Climate adaptation is one of those things. It's not a nice to have. It, it is a must have. We've got to be able to do this in order to make sure that we continue to meet all of our goals. You can find our climate change adaptation guide at electricity.ca. Electricity is transforming every aspect of Canadians' lives. CEA members are Canada's largest electricity providers. The CEA Corporate Partner Program is your opportunity to connect to our members through in-person and virtual events in our many marketing channels. You'll gain access to decision makers across the entire electricity value chain, from generation through to the end customer. Contact us about becoming a CEA corporate partner. Together, our future is very bright. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Gregg and I'm the President and CEO of Nova Scotia Power. I'm very pleased to join you today to introduce the next speaker. From dealing with cyber attacks, extreme weather, and a changing electricity resource mix, the role of leading North America's electricity grid regulatory authority has likely never been more important. Thankfully, the person in the job has proven himself more than capable of steering the helm of the North American Electric Reliability Corporation known as NERC. That said, it is my pleasure to introduce Jim Robb, President and CEO of NERC. 
Jim oversees the, the mission of the organization, assuring the reliability and security of the North American bulk power system, directing key programs affecting more than 1,400 bulk power system owners, operators, and users. Jim has extensive energy sector experience, more than 30 years, in fact, as an engineer, a consultant, and a senior executive. This includes serving as president and CEO of the Western Electricity Coordinating Council, or WEC, where he was responsible for the strategic direction and leadership of all of WEC's activities. I have also had the great pleasure of working with Jim, so I can say that uh, he is one of those people who, in addition to being a very strong leader, is an all-around good person as well. And with that, I'm pleased to turn it over to my friend, Jim Rock. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for having me here today. The Canadian Electricity Association is a very important constituency in our ERO mission, and I've seen a significant improvement in our institutional relationship over the last three years. I, I really want to thank Francis for his leadership and friendship. He was the first unofficial introduction I had to CEA when he and I bumped into each other at a global regulatory meeting in Cancun before I had actually started to work at NERC, and he was already starting to give me the business. Um, but seriously, we're both uh, Jeep aficionados, and uh, he's been a great friend, uh, and, and I think we've got a very good working relationship together. I'm sorry that we're having to do this via video. I had intended to join you live, but some of you might have heard that we had a tragedy in the NERC world this past weekend, with one of our longtime employees dying suddenly Friday night evening. I decided the right thing to do was to attend his memorial service to support his family and a number of our teammates who are really reeling from this unexpected loss. I appreciate your understanding and Francis offering this format up as an alternative. And next time we'll meet again in person for real as the pandemic gets extinguished over the balance of this year. So much has happened in the last year and a half since the pandemic started. We're all substantially changed by an extraordinary set of stressors and experiences that will forever change how we think about each other and the work we do. Certainly in this last year, we've seen the continuation of the 3D transformation impacting the electric grid the push for more decarbonized generation with variable production profiles, the shift toward more distributed generation, either on the distribution system or behind the meter, and the expansion of digital control systems and devices on the grid and within the loads. These devices have brought tremendous benefits to the grid and to its customers. Capturing the rapidly improving economics of solar production has lowered costs. The environmental footprint of the sector has improved significantly and the operations and control of the system have become much more efficient. However, there's no free lunch. These changes are clearly challenging our traditional reliability paradigm and have come at the cost of rapidly escalating operational complexity in an increased cyber attack surface. Over the last 10 months, we've seen fissures emerge in the sector that demand that we respond. Last August, an interconnection-wide heat event in California led to the shedding of 800,000 customers. The California system operator was unable to import power as planned in the late afternoon as the solar generation was waning while peak load continued to build. It reminds us of the critical need for reliable balancing resources and the need for improved estimates of resource availability, especially during times of stress. The bookend cold weather events in the Middle South in February bring similar lessons about the impact of wide area extreme events and the need for robust planning against extremes, which are becoming more extreme and frankly becoming more common. This time it was a winter event, and while we're still working through the jo formal joint inquiry with FERC, the lack of winterization across fuel types and within the fuel system itself would appear to be at the root of the massive supply failure ERCOT had to manage. It also highlights the essentiality of electric service to other critical infrastructures, most visibly the water system, but also communications. As my friend Tom Fanning of the Southern Company and chair of the ESCC has said, electricity is 7% of the economy, but it's the first 7%. And he's right, without the juice, nothing else works. And not only has Mother Nature been a challenge in the past year, but our adversaries have been very active as well. The supply chain attacks we have seen over the last six months instantly sobered a lot of us up very quickly. The successful tax involving SolarWinds, Microsoft Exchange, and most recently Pulse Connect Secure demonstrate the advanced capabilities and extreme patience of our nation state adversaries. Importantly, these attacks demonstrate their ability to solve the one-to-many problem by infecting a commonly used system and then immediately getting access to all users of that system and their networks. 
and their ability to, to traverse networks and secure administrative rights is very frightening indeed. This is a new flavor of a coordinated attack that again demands we respond. And most recently, the ransomware shutdown of the Colonial Pipeline system shows how vulnerable we are to organized cybercrime. Colonial, a single asset, supported 45% of the Eastern Seaboard's fuel supply. In our zeal for efficiency, we find ourselves incredibly dependent on a small number of critical assets without nearly the amount of redundancy that we've built into the, the electric grid. Within three days, a system with tons of inventory, gasoline prices increased significantly, and fuel was largely unavailable in many East Coast cities. If this had been a natural gas pipeline where in-market inventories are much less common, the results would have been catastrophic. And of course, none of these events are exclusively American. As we all know, electricity is governed by the law of physics and not national borders. So it's very important that we confront these challenges together. More extreme weather events, wildfires, and the step change in cyber attacks. So what do we do about this? Well, one thing's for sure, we can't sit here and admire the problem or the problems. They will continue to grow in complexity as the benefits of grid transformation are reinforced by improved economics, efficiencies, and environmental impact. But we can protect ourselves better, plan better, and with help from our decision makers, we can manage the pace of this transition to ensure that reliability has an equal seat at the table with economics and the environment. At NERC, we're focused on four major areas. The first is improving resiliency against extreme weather events. Our board last week adopted the first version of a winterization standard that will be filed with FERC for approval later this summer. This is an important step in improving climate resiliency, and we expect the standard to be modified as we conclude the inquiry into the federal event, February event. We're also working on a series of actions we can take in the interim until that standard is effective, and we'll be discussing those with our board and MRC in August. The second is related to building the capabilities and requirements in the OMP standards to focus on energy adequacy and not just capacity and to expand the planning requirements to include mitigation plans against more extreme events. We have the support of the ISO RTO Council and hope to have a standards authorization request developed later this year to start a formal standard setting process to address energy adequacy. The third is rethinking the bright line criteria and structure of the SIP devices. Our SIP standards are, are categorized into high, medium, and low impact devices. And, and we think really we need to shift that focus away from the device itself and to focus more on external routable connectivity, because uh, that will help address the supply chain risks we're seeing. This is of course going to be very tricky as the number of low impact devices is voluminous and many small entities depend on third party service providers to have access to their systems. And we don't want to deny them that. However, we do want to make sure that when third parties access your system, that you know who they are and what they're doing. So it's clear that a system needs to be rigorously controlled, likely through a zero trust model with systems monitored continuously for untoward activity. And then finally, our fourth priority is to continue to build the capabilities of the ISAC and leverage it as a formal convener and communication port for information sharing among asset owner operators and from our government partners in the US as well as Canada. I can tell you under Manny Cancel's leadership, the ISAC is firing on all cylinders right now, and it has been incredibly active supporting industry and the enterprise through the step change in cyber attacks. In addition to the basic information sharing and analysis function, we're focused on a handful of major initiatives right now. The first is working closely with industry to support the U.S. Department of Energy's 100-day plan to deploy network monitoring technology in the OT systems of the sector, similar to our CRISP program today. While this is a U.S. program, our goal will be to work with the government to rapidly de declassify insights so they can be shared across the industry and with our Canadian members. We also continue to work with the IESO to strengthen information sharing between their Project Lighthouse initiative and our own monitoring programs and to continue to strengthen cross-border information sharing and collaboration on security matters. I have to remind everybody that this year is a GridX year. And we're working on a model to even better integrate Canadian industry and government in our executive tabletop to help us think through how to navigate the challenges of another simulated attack that has impacts both north and south of our border. But you know, at some level, these are the easy issues. Uh, analytical, embedded in the physical world, which are governed by physical laws that we can all understand and adhere to. I'd like to close by talking a few minutes about adaptation and the importance of community. 
I mentioned that we lost a valued team member too early and very unexpectedly this past weekend. His untimely death has really forced me to think about people, community, and how at the end of the day, studies, assessments, investments, rate cases, et cetera, all the things that we focus so much time and attention on, at the end of the day are really much less important than the ecosystem of people that we can bring together to meet a mission. I regularly tell the team at NERC that nearly 400 million North Americans depend on us doing our job. It's a complex fabric of entities ranging from asset owner operators to policymakers to NGOs to entities like NERC and the regional entities that don't fit into a cleanly into a bucket to come together and to make this incredibly complex machine we call the bulk power system operate reliably and effectively. Watching the crises that start to form when the power system is unavailable is sobering. Cascading water system crises, communications failures, people coping as best they can, but often in ways they compromise their health and safety. Indeed, that first 7% is really foundational to everything else we depend on. We've come a long way since the 2003 Northeast blackout and the initial creation of the ERO model, and we've accomplished tons together. The social fabric of the enterprise is markedly improved under the executive committee structure that we put in place in the first quarter of 2019. And with that, the alignment of our programs is improving steadily. Our restructuring of our technical committees at NERC to develop integrated focus on operations, planning, and security has also been a great success. Our relationships with industry through the trade associations continues to improve. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. I, again, I very much appreciate being here and for all that you do within your own companies, but also with us to help us succeed in our mission. Top talent arrayed against the critical risks facing the industry are two of the four core value drivers we, are, we aligned around in our golden circle at NERC. It's critical because we aren't solving the problems of our grandfather's electric system. We have a 21st century issues and we need 21st century solutions. And with that, thank you very much. And Francis, I enjoy uh, sparring with you for a little bit. <laughs> Jim, thank you very much for your comments. We really appreciate it. And uh, certainly recognize the significant changes that we've seen over, over the recent past. Um, the last time you and I sat down and had a, a, a deep conversation was when we recorded a podcast my goodness, a little over two years ago, and things sure have changed since then. And you, and you gave us a sense of some of the recent challenges with respect to reliability. I was I was intrigued when you, you talked about the development, or the potential development of uh, of a, a standard in, in with respect to energy adequacy. Um, now I know the work has only only begun, but any sense of where this where this might go and what it potentially could look like? Because this has been a, a gap for quite some time. Yeah, I can, uh, I, I can speculate, um, but again, hard problem and, and not one we've yeah. really dealt with because we've always kind of thought if you had a plant, you always assumed that there was fuel behind it. Right. Well, that's not the case with renewables and, uh, and, and, and uh, it's not always the case with natural gas as our friends in New England uh, find out uh, quite frequently. Uh, and, and in fact, much of the work and the thinking here is really uh, inspired by the adaptations that the New England system operator has put in place to deal with a highly constrained fuel system. You know, the, this could go in a lot of different ways, but the, the, the leading thinking right now is to, uh, in the uh, operating horizon, uh, is to develop a 21-day energy plan uh, that, you know, that gives you as much uh, visibility as you can in terms of the resources and the energy supply that you'll have to, to serve load and to pre-think out what mitigation steps you would need to take uh, if indeed any part of that uh, formula starts to fall apart. And then most importantly, <clears throat> what we want to do on uh, 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 you know, planning under more extreme conditions, because that's when the system gets tested, right? It doesn't get tested on a, on a cool day in April, right? It's, it, it's, it's the extreme days that are... Uh, um, that, that, that are problematic or the days when so much generation is planned to be offline. Have the mitigation steps uh, laid out and then make those very transparent to the policymakers that have the ability to do something about it. You know, one of the issues and one of the frustrations is, is that um, you know, we can't mandate anybody to build, uh, which is fine, right? Those should be local, local decisions. Um, but, uh, but, but, but people who can need to understand the consequences of not having enough generation of certain types in the system. Um, so visibility to policymakers is going to be a big part of the standard as well. So I, I, I think we, we've only scratched the surface here, uh, uh, Jim, in, in the time that was uh, allotted to us. We'll have to get you back onto the, onto the Flux Capacitor podcast and, and uh, let's drill down on this once again.
Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you for, for your valuable thoughts and, and insights on the many reliability and security challenges that we're facing today in North America. Well, thank you, Francis. I very much appreciate to be here and I look forward to seeing you in person soon. Terrific. I, I'm now pleased to, to introduce today's panel discussion. This has been a very interesting year for our sector, as you've heard already today. While undergoing a period of rapid transformation, COVID forced us to change the way we've operated and how we've worked for decades. While we could continue to discuss COVID and its many impacts on our sector, we're instead looking ahead to a time of renewal. We're ready to renew and to return to the work we were doing before the world stopped. And for our sector, much of this work is focused on environmental, social, and governance strategies. I'm looking forward to hearing from our members on how they are prioritizing ESG within their organizations. I'd like to introduce our, our, introduce our moderator for today's panel, Jay Graywall, the president and CEO of Manitoba Hydro. I'd also like to welcome Andrew Hall, president and chief executive officer of Yukon Energy, David Murray, chief innovation officer at Hydro Quebec, Janine Sullivan, the president and chief executive officer of Fortis Alberta, and Jose Guibard, chief executive officer of Evolution. I will now turn things over to Jay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our executive panel that will speak on the topic of ESG. And what do we mean by ESG? It's environmental, it's social, and it's governance. And even by, by that definition, you can see what a broad topic this is. And so I'm very pleased that we have a very strong executive panel that are going to answer a series of questions from the perspectives of their business. And it'll be a very interactive discussion. Some of the things that we're going to touch on in this conversation is how each of us, these organizations, create and deliver social value to the communities that they operate in. And also from that perspective, how, do they, how are they intending as we transition to more of a carbon neutral environment to ensure that these communities get long-term value from that transition? Then we're going to pivot and shift to a discussion about what is needed in order for each of these companies to be successful in delivering on that mandate. So without further ado, I, I'd like to now just uh, start with the panel questions and the first one. And we're going to talk about the social value for local communities. And by local communities, that also includes Indigenous peoples. So a key part of ESG is creating that social value for the communities that we operate in. And we operate in so many different communities. So the question I'd like to ask for each panel member is, what has been your long-term community investment strategy to deliver that social value? And specifically, if you could speak to it from the perspective of community development, from a procurement perspective, from an education perspective, and additionally, from an employment perspective. And so we'll, uh, we'll start Firstly, with David from Hydro-Quebec, if you could uh, share from a Hydro-Quebec perspective how you and Hydro-Quebec create value for the communities you operate in. Good afternoon, uh, Jay. Thank you for the question. So first of all, yeah, Hydro-Quebec, so we, we've been, uh, we've been uh, involved with the uh, Indigenous communities over 75 years uh, as we, we were building Hydro-Quebec, uh, and we've been... Uh, focusing on three criteria in, in the uh, ESG fa factor. So the economic, the environmental, and the social aspect of it. So in, in Quebec, we, uh, we obviously consider Indigenous communities as partners. Uh, we have 11 First Nations in, in Quebec, and we, we currently have 40 agreements uh, that we've, we've done with the different uh, communities. So we're, we're, uh, we're really uh, trying to get closer and closer with the, with the communities. Um, um, we've, uh, we're actually giving, you know, as we're, we're making agreements, uh, we're giving, uh, local contracts for the, uh, the, the indigenous enterprises. So locally, we want them to be autonomous and be, uh, providing for, uh, for us and helping us in building, you know, the different projects that we, uh, that we're having. Second thing we're trying to do is obviously, uh, hire as many, uh, uh people from the community part of Hydro Quebec, which is, uh, completely uh, different uh, endeavor and which is actually giving us uh, an appreciation of how we uh, can be even better in, in dealing and treating with, uh, with the, uh, the community. So we have over 
350 people uh, from the communities working in uh, ranks now, so which is actually uh, a fantastic opportunities. And what we're doing uh, lately, we've done uh, uh, projects where, uh, uh, example, uh, our last project we've done with the uh, Apuyat uh, uh, community, uh, we, we actually uh, work and give them a 200 megawatt contract with, with one of their partners. So we're trying to build on the long terms uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the different communities as, uh, as they develop the expertise. Uh, they develop the knowledge they can uh, the, the and, and benefit from that and building after that other projects and and more uh, just uh, for example this week uh, we actually um, uh, made a contract as uh, as people might people uh, uh, probably don't know but we're, we're actually uh, negotiating a contract and uh, with uh, New York with the CHP a transmission line and we have uh, we've made an agreement uh, where the Mohawk community would actually be a joint owner of, of the line that will pass through uh, uh, to our, the, the border uh, with the New York uh, bid that we're doing. So we're trying to, uh, to involve ourselves at, uh, at many and many aspects with them. So we, uh, we are providing and we're partners together. Thank you, David, I appreciate that. Jose, would uh, be really interested in hearing the perspective from your organization. Yeah, so for uh, Evolugen, obviously we believe in, in the importance of our, our, our community partnerships. We're across the country, uh, of course, and we have partnerships uh, uh, everywhere. And we have communities, we work in many different communities, remote, less remote, uh, and and it, it's very important to us to maintain those. Uh, and the way we've approached it uh, uh, in more recent times, uh, we've always been in, involved, but we've, we've in the context of setting up our ESG program, have, have done a materiality assessment and, and gone back to communities to really have a conversation with them about their needs and, and what they feel is important to them and how we can help further. Uh, and that includes a variety of things. We can, it, it, it's either, you know, providing solutions for them, uh, it's partnerships, it's procurement, uh, you know, employing their people, their contractors in, in their local communities, uh, and also providing education, uh, you know, helping them with educating around our assets, the dangers of our assets, or the rivers around, uh, or, or water systems. Uh, and, and also, of course, involves, you know, donations, uh, supporting the community in, in some of its, its projects, uh, whether that's medical health assistance, uh, we supported vaccination programs recently, um, it also involves uh, um, uh, equipment for the community and certain, you know, particular functions, whether it's fire, fire, uh, firefighters or, or things like that. It's it's very important to us to have our operations team who are members of the community involved in those decisions, involved in in that effort, uh, and it's an ongoing ongoing effort. I'll, maybe I'll talk about indigenous uh, our indigenous partnerships uh, after uh, if if there's still some time. Perfect. I appreciate that. And I think we'll have an opportunity in some of the other follow-up questions, Jose, to talk specifically about that. Janine, from a Fortis, Alberta perspective. Sure. Thanks, Jay. So at Fortis, Alberta, uh, we serve about 240 communities right across Alberta. Our employees work and live in those communities that we serve. So our community investment program is based on the guiding principle that our organization's success depends on the well-being of the communities in which we operate and where those employees live and work. So accordingly, our approach is to empower communities by contributing to organizations that offer programs and services aligned with our business priorities, including safety, education, the environment, and wellness. So community investment in rural areas, we found can have a large impact in creating value for those communities, as well, including the 22 indigenous and Métis communities that we serve. So when we work on indigenous lands and in traditional territories, we always involve the community members in our process and hire and train people from the area. And we've worked hard to develop deep substantive relationships with those communities. So for example, as part of Indigenous History Month, we've had the opportunity to invite four elders to share their history and their stories with our employees and uh, our, our communities, other broad communities, so that we create an awareness and you know, a really strong relationship for working forward with them. Um, further, we actively seek out projects and causes that have a tangible and positive impact on people, land, and wildlife. So, for example, in Alberta, you'll see us participating around causes like Alberta Birds of Prey 
dealing with rehabilitation of injured birds, dare to care, so around bullying and anti-bullying programs, uh, earth rangers, you know, educating kids about biodiversity and sustainable behaviors. And with respect to indigenous, we just uh, renewed a multi-year contract with uh, Lethbridge College uh, in terms of sponsorship of indigenous programs. So, you know, really trying to cover all aspects of ESG in terms of working with our communities. Um, of course, in light of innovation, really looking for opportunities that provide long lasting impactful results, particularly in rural Alberta. So in terms of emerging uh, technology, looking at partnerships that uh, focus on the ag tech space, for example, and creating value and jobs in those communities in that area. And finally, of course, we try to tie all of our giving back to green. So we look at grants to municipalities for LED electrophytes for, for public buildings, look for other energy efficiency projects. And, uh, you know, as an, an obvious example, in terms of advocating for electrification, we just signed a sponsorship agreement uh, to brand the first electric Zamboni in the province. So a, lot, a great variety of things that we're doing uh, in terms of investing in communities and creating value throughout the province. Thank you, Janine. And last but not least, our friend from the Yukon, Andrew. Thanks, Jay. Um, quite similar to, to the prior comments, I, I think firstly, and I think it's, it's, it's common across the group, communities typically for us mean indigenous communities, um, but it's not always the case, but I, but I think it's useful to, to sort of focus on, on the work with indigenous communities. Um, and, and our work is typically focused on project development as opposed to ongoing operations. Um, we, as a smaller utility, quite difficult to get into sort of broad-based community development um, outside of the sort of project context. So the, the, the focus for us has been on in, within the project, um, creating those contracting opportunities. So we've had a, quite a lot of success there with uh, indigenous owned businesses. Um, the procurement, procurement opportunities, um, investments. So the, the, the final agreements, the modern day treaties in the Yukon create a framework for, for investments um, that, that uh, First Nations can make in, in projects. Um, what hasn't worked so well for us has been the employment and education side. And, and you know, I think it's reflective of the fact that some of these communities are in some respects, near full employment. In other words, uh, it's, it's, it can be very difficult to find um, ind Indigenous citizens who are available to work. So we haven't had much less success with that. Um, and then the final one I'd, I'd say that started to become more important is building in reconciliation opportunities into these agreements. So we, we will typically bring in the Yukon government to the table um, in the reconciliation conversation. Um, because often our regulatory framework doesn't really allow us to spend a lot of money looking back in time. But, but that reconciliation is important and often the Yukon government can, can bring the funds to the table to, to allow us to build in those cultural activities to, to allow for a, recon, a reconciliation you know, event or, or series of events. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Andrew. And, um, you know, what was interesting is uh, what this demonstrates is every single one of the, uh, the organizations that you represent here today is quite mature in how you're dealing with the communities and the Indigenous. For us as Manitoba Hydro, uh, like you, Andrew, our, the communities we tend to operate in, given we're hydro related, are, are primarily Indigenous communities. And you know we're very proud to say uh, that we work on it from both fronts. Ongoing operating basis, 18% of the population in Manitoba is Indigenous, and 20% of our workforce, our 5,400, are Indigenous, self-identifying. Uh, but in our northern communities, where we have the majority, um, I think 85, going up to 90% with Kiask of our generation, almost 45% of our employees are Indigenous there. Uh, so a lot of efforts gone into it, just like with all of you in doing it. So the joint venture partnerships on projects, the equity partnerships in pro projects, and the capability building are all key to driving that value. So if we now go to the next question, I mean, earlier in the symposium, we heard the minister speak about the transition to a lower carbon future. 
And for all of us, that means building the support of the, the Indigenous peoples in that transition that we're going to make. So I'd, I'd like you to speak to the specific measures you're going to be taking, not what you've taken already, what you spoke to earlier, but that you're going to be taking to ensure these communities derive long-term value and however you define that from an ESG perspective, from the infrastructure investments. And uh, when you respond, if you could uh, take the opportunity to frame it, not only from the opportunity perspective, but also what you might see as some of the challenges. And this time, let's start with you, Andrew, because you specifically spoke to the fact that in the Yukon, uh, the opportunities with the Indigenous have been project-based. Yeah, so, so to pick up on that theme, um, I, I, I think going forward, we're, we're probably going to end with a model where our new generation assets are Indigenous owned, and it, and it may go as far as uh, transmission as well. Um, I, I, was, I was curious to hear about Hydro-Quebec's, um, and I know there's other examples um, across the country of Indigenous ownership in transmission, but um, I think all our future generation will be Indigenous owned. Um, obviously, there's different models as to how to do that. I mean, I, I'm not sure we'll go to a full IPP model, but um, some sort of shared um, situation where we're Indigenous owned, but, but Yukon Energy operated is probably where we'll land. Um, but certainly, if you look at our, our long-term resource plan and the, the major projects that we have um, in that plan, in all three cases, so it's one hydro, one transmission, and one pump storage, um, I think we'll end up with indigenous ownership. And and I, I really, did, I, I don't see any other option really, because you know the dynamic when you go into the community and try and solicit support for a project is inevitably you, you, you talk very quickly about ownership. So um, I think that's the main the main change. And I mean, that that is not a simple path to, to tread. Um, and not not always politically easy either. Um, so you know, I think it, it's easy when it's a nice hands um, arms length IPP transaction, um, but something more involved where, where with ownership and operations potentially being completed by different entities. You know, we we yet to experience the the complexity of trying to make that happen. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's that's uh, I'll, I'll end there. Thank you, Andrew. And, and for those uh, who are uh, sitting in and, and participating in the symposium, what I should have identified earlier is that for those who aren't aware, both Andrew and David, so Yukon Energy and uh, Hydro-Quebec are crowns. They are owned by governments. So David, if, uh, if you could pick it up from there, because I'm curious if there's a difference between if you a, are a crown owned by governments and the people of your your province and territory versus if you're private sector. Yeah, I would say uh, it's pretty uh, it's pretty uh, similar. I would say because uh, actually in Hydro Quebec we're working hands in hands with the government. So as we're meeting the communities, the the, the Quebec government is is there with us. So. Um, you know, going long term, I think there's opportunities, like I was saying earlier, joint partnership, I think, is going to be uh, uh, certainly a possibility, just like we've done in the latest uh, latest uh, couple of projects. Uh, one thing that is interesting, though, um, so we're, we're going to, uh, typically with the communities with standard uh, projects, uh, production, transmission, distribution. But what really is happening now is the energy transition is kicking in. And... It will derive, it will bring new types of uh, uh, solutions. And uh, I believe we need to think about uh, how we involve the communities into these new types of solution. One example is, you know, everything that is IoT, for example, and giving them a chance to go into um, uh, building a home in their communities where you have, you know, net zero uh, home and microgrids and, and really be uh, you know, on the front of that energy transition, uh, giving them the possibilities to learn uh, how to build these uh, new communities. Uh, I know uh, I was another panel at one point, and I know in Manitoba they are they actually uh, working some of these uh, these solutions. So I, I uh, actually uh, made connections uh, there just to understand where they're we're at, and I think we could learn uh, from what is being done here in Quebec and what's done up north in Manitoba. So I was quite impressed. 
And uh, we, we just want to do that and, and push these, these boundaries. So building with, uh, with these new technologies. And, and in some places, um, uh, we are uh, building for Hydro-Quebec new facilities for our own employees up north. And right now we're, we're looking at ways to have them uh, have the communities to operate uh, these uh, uh, these communities for us where people are, are staying and actually to build these uh, new communities with these new technology. Uh, the second thing is really up north. If you go, you know, three hours uh, with a plane going, typically going three hours of plane, you're going and you're going to Florida. But uh, going going uh, going up north, uh, we're trying to also to build with new technologies, bring solar panels and and uh, and new ways to to collect the energy and really uh bring the communities to work uh, closely with uh, with us so it's really changing making the shift and learning from the the energy transition that's coming along thank you david and and i do appreciate your positive comments about manitoba hydro and i think there's always opportunities for all of us to learn from one another, which is why you know conversations like this are of, of great value. Uh, Jose, did you want to go next? Sure. Um, so on our on our side, uh, uh, what we've recently done and what we're looking forward to in, in the future replicating uh, is we've we've recently issued our indigenous principles. So we we worked hard on 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 setting some principles as how we were going to engage. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say any, any of that is, is earth shatteringly new, but it's just kind of formalizing uh, some of some of that approach. Uh, and and what we'd say is is. From, from experience of what we've done in the past, we do have uh, for indigenous um, communities that are equity owners in some of our assets. Uh, and in particular, the most recent one is, is the building of our Kokish facility in BC. And that was a great example. And we, we wanna replicate that uh, in, in that early engagement and really working with the community in finding the solution, both on an economic front, but also on, on ecological uh, conservation front for fish and, and fish habitat uh, to really, you know, it, there was a bit of a, a start and stop. And, and so re -going, going back to the table and really uh, engaging earlier and, and uh, not making uh, that mistake and, and making sure that we're, we're listening and we're all at the table early on to be able to come with the best solution. Uh, so that was on, on more the ecological front, but also on the economic front we were able to find a solution to help them participate economically at, at a 25% level into uh, uh, owning the asset as, as an equity partner. So something we definitely want to replicate going forward. That also includes, uh, you know, employment or, or using Indigenous contractors uh, to work on our sites. Uh, and, and we're currently working on creating a, a contractor list uh, in each of the provinces where we operate to employ even more uh, Indigenous contractors. Uh, again, I'll, I'll reiterate, like early engagement and ongoing relationship is key. And we've learned, you know, uh, uh, where we haven't been able to maintain the relationship or we acquire an asset that wasn't maintained by us. Uh, uh, it's important to rebuild that trust, and 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 by having that trust, that's how we'll we'll continue to build and and develop with those communities. Well, that's great, Jose. And one of the things we've learned is in creating these contracts where we identify Indigenous content, what's really important is not only the commitment, but to measure against that and reporting out and then there being implications if those aren't achieved, because those are commitments we make to those communities, even if it's third parties that we're using. Uh, and last but not least, Janine. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. So obviously, as an investor-owned utility, uh, we are focused on responding to the needs of the grid over the long term. So when we seek out partnerships, we're looking for those that will benefit the communities that use that grid over the long term as well. So we want there to be benefits for generations uh, to come. So we work with groups like Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation to seek out those mutually beneficial projects. And we're looking at things that range from, you know, you know, mainstream reliability projects to high speed internet to generation. So certainly looking for those long term investments with communities that can benefit jointly with us in those investments. Thank you. So now let's transition from talking about creating social value in the communities we operate in to what needs to be true for us to be able to deliver on those intentions. Um, and specifically, we're going to talk about risk and we're gonna talk about capital financing uh, relative to this green transition. So we've all seen there's a, um, an emerging consensus globally, federally, regionally, about the need for governments, businesses, investors, and all stakeholders to act 
urgently in terms of addressing climate change. So can each of you describe the challenges and the opportunities that you're facing related to this urgent action uh, to address climate change? Um, and particularly what we'd like you to comment on um, are two things. And these are two things that need to be true to enable the successful execution. One of them is how do you secure the capital, the financing? And the second one is the regulatory approvals necessary because we are a regulated industry. So how do those, what needs to happen there to, to support this transition to a low carbon energy future? And on this one and the, the following questions on topics in this area, what I'm going to do is ask one panelist who's identified they have a particular interest or, or more to share on that front to speak. And then I'll give the other panelists a couple of minutes um, to respond and then we'll move on to the next question because uh, we do still have three questions left to get through. So with this one, Jose, I know you have a lot to share on this front. Yeah, so so on on uh, investment and and capital, uh, you know, we know it's as you said, there's there's a lot of capital chasing these types of investments, uh, and we have capital at our our disposal to invest in those investments. Uh, we've recently announced our, our our Brookfield Global Transition Fund, which will help uh, uh, finance some of those transitions. We see a lot of value there, uh, specifically with respect to, to climate change and addressing climate change. Um, so while many may be looking for passive investment, we're here looking more for helping that transition, looking to use our long-term expertise uh, to develop, own, and operate uh, those renewable assets uh, and to provide those unique solutions uh, uh, that others may not be able to provide. And so th the things we're focusing on is, is renewables development, transition support and, and technology investment. And from a, a, you know all that being said, even though we have that access to that capital, there's certain things that need to be in place. There's, there's still financing uh, uh, requirements in terms of how we structure an investment. Uh, there's, there's significant interest globally in, 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 from commercial lenders to, to support uh, uh, investing and they're eager to participate uh, in, in this transition to net zero. Uh, uh, what, what we're seeing, however, is, is that at times they, they aren't able to participate or there's a concern because the, the, the asset needs to be or the project needs to be backed by a long-term offtake or credit worthy offtaker uh, and that for an IPP uh, therein lies a bit more of a challenge right so so uh, sometimes having that commercial uh, lender participate is is challenging and that's where we can see the participation or the support of other uh, other investors or in this case perhaps government involvement where they can support a technology or a project that uh, might not be able to be supported by uh, a commercial lender given, you know, if we, if we think about hydrogen or things like that, uh, that there may need to be a, a bit more of support. So that's part of, of, of an, a way to bridge uh, that financing solution until the commercial viability of a technology is, is proven or, or the scale of it uh, is, is, is uh, proven. Um, and I guess on regulatory front, uh, um, we as an IPP operate in a, a very regulated environment amongst utilities that, that ob obtain that regulated rate of return. Uh, in our case, the private capital supports our investments rather than a rate base or a tax base. And what that requires is certainty, uh, as you also <laughs> require certainty. Uh, uh, we need certainty in that investment and the appropriate regulatory framework around it. Uh, so what we've found is, is as we look at new investments or look at new ways of decarbonizing, uh, not just the, the, the low hanging fruit of wind and solar and, and hydro, uh, uh, we've found that regulation needs to be able to keep up. And regulation needs to be able to provide approvals, but also even changing the regulation to allow certain of those developments to benefit from some of the incentives that are being put in the marketplace uh, uh, in different markets. Thank you. Um, just for a different perspective, would Andrew or David have any comments that might be different than uh, uh, what Jose has shared? So maybe I can, uh, I totally agree with uh, Jose. Um... So, uh, number one, I mean, uh, um, the regulator, uh, you know, the focus of the regulator today is to keep, you know, the, the minimum impact on, on, the, on the rates. And there is a cost, you know, to do an energy transition to reduce the GHG emission. So, when you look 
only focus at one aspect, you know, the equations, I mean, it, it could push, you know, it, it pushes us sometimes uh, uh, into a longer process in order to achieve these, uh, uh, these GHG emissions. So for sure, uh, there's got to be some, some ways to think differently about the, about the approach. Uh, number two, I would say um, focus. Um, we need, I mean, everybody, it, it's a very, uh, uh, there's an upside, a lot of possibilities in the energy transition. So we need to focus as, as a government, we need to focus as a society to put the dollar where you're going to have the best and the most impact on the GHG emission. And it's very, very difficult because everybody's pulling his rug and, you know, from, from, his, end, from his end to, to have a share of the possibilities and make money out of this. But we really have to focus and put the put the dollar where it, it's going to give us the the, uh, the benefits as as much as as possible. And number three, we're all talking about converting, mm -hmm. uh, converting to you know and bring uh, new projects, uh, new production, which is going to be greener and everything. But I believe that one aspect is also how could we uh, reduce the consumption and change the way with new technology today is that's the best thing we could do because you know as you're going in and whatever you're producing solar wind uh, hydro whatever you're going to go in the environment there's going to be some uh, some impacts uh, as you're going and you're just reducing the consumption now and you're going you know behind the meter for example uh, this is something that's going to it's going to make it you know even even better and and um, i'm sure you know a dollar saved is probably uh, uh, to, to to catch the uh, uh, the, the reduction of the energy is probably cheaper than producing and building new infrastructure. So uh, this is something that we're really putting a focus on, uh, on hydro, at the Hydro Quebec. So a lot of innovation behind the meter. So we've started a, a few subsidiary company now, and uh, that's a big push. But trying to push this with the regulator, not very, very difficult because it's completely uh, different from what we've been living in the past 50 years. So evolution of the regulator would be something very important. So, David, if I recall correctly, I think the subsidiary you created to go behind the meter and offer greater services and products is called Hilo. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's actually I Ilo. I, I, Ilo. Ilo. You could you could you could say it was like French English, but I, Ilo. So yes, it's a sub company where we're going with uh, with um, um, you know smart thermostat, uh, and we're actually building on on solar panel. V2G, V2H, these are all features that are coming uh, coming along uh, in in the plan, uh, which is going to be uh, quite exciting. And now we're, we've started one microgrid to test that, but now we have ways to look into building more. And uh, we want to push the boundaries and do something crazy. And uh, you can, I was talking about the regulator. Can you imagine thinking about peer-to-peer -peer exchange of energy? So that's going to be like Mount Everest going through this. But uh, the, the, these are types of stuff that we want to we want to do. And we believe that, you know, it could be like 20% savings of energy if we if we are careful. And we have to be realistic, you know, in Canada, uh, we're not very, you know, energy uh, savvy. I mean, uh, you know, everybody's leaving house. I don't know, maybe I'm alone, but uh, everybody leaves everything on in, in my house. You know, I have to keep telling everybody because it's it's not expensive enough, I guess, you know. So we have to find ways to do it. And we're, we're, we're trying, we're, we're launching a few companies to do that. And, and another one we're looking into finally is uh, we want to, we're thinking about launching something about energy as a service. So it's all nice. You got these uh, saying, oh, we bought like three buses, electric buses and everything, but they go with the wire and they say, where are we going to put the wire now? So how does that work? And what's the best time to recharge so I don't impact the power and, uh, you know, and uh, what's the rate and everything. So uh, enabling this and working with banks and trying to, you know, put this capex that's going to be huge you want to convert you know all the public transportation it's like a billion dollar you have to invest and so everybody's coming with their buses but we're going to face a problem so energy as a service you put you know transform capital uh, capex to opex and you absorb this on time it will enable you know a better uh, better uh, transition so i'll stop there no, thank you. And it's interesting because I think, it's, Jose, you focused on how you're transitioning and building new. And, and David, you've been talking about other levers that exist to, to achieve some of those same objectives. And I think, you know, the, what this is demonstrating is it is a multi-pronged, multi-lever model that we're existing in. And, you know, Andrew or Janine, is there anything else you'd like to add that uh, we haven't talked about on this particular topic? Well, I don't know if you should get me started, Jay, because I could probably take up the rest of our time if I was to uh, to really get into it all. But I mean, 
Fortis Alberta is a pure play distribution facility owner and operator. So we are focused primarily on the grid. And at no other time have we seen so much change in technology and increasing demand being placed on our grid. So we're enabling so many new services. The grid is a vital backbone to the industry, the economy, and to climate action. And this is a 100-year-old industry, and the regulation legislation guiding our industry has become pretty entrenched over that time. Yet today, we're asking more and more of our grid. So a grid that was once designed, to David's point, for one-way power flow is now delivering a suite of services with mesh networks, distributed energy resources throughout the system, uh, performing as power backup lines uh, in terms of under supply of renewables. Uh, so we're not just delivering power anymore. And regulation and legislation has to transition as well. But it hasn't been easy. And uh, David highlighted that. I mean, the concepts of the regulatory compact that Jose referred to and the concepts of cost of service versus performance uh, based regulation are being challenged. And regulators are looking for government policy to provide uh, clarity and set direction. And many climate and action investments may or may not be considered traditional utility assets. And so the question is often raised as to what we can and we cannot invest as utilities. Um, but I think that, you know, we always have to remind the regulator and uh, other stakeholders that regulated utilities can help ensure social equity. As a public utility, we have long-term financing options that can facilitate participation for all customers in climate action programs. So many programs are out of reach for many Canadians, even with grants and incentives that might be available. So we must address social equity and not create an environment where only a portion of society can reap the benefits that come with climate action and the energy transition. The purpose of utilities is to provide essential services in a socially equitable fashion. So we can still play a role to ensure that all customers benefit from climate action. And, you know, as distribution utilities, we are well positioned to have a significant impact on customers' GHG emission reductions through energy efficiency programs, especially in those smaller communities and in rural areas where uh, resources might often be limited. Um, if we can set aside the regulatory burdens, there's a lot that we could be doing in terms of creating opportunities. And, you know, ultimately, as I think we'll all agree, I mean, our core responsibility is to ensure the safety, resiliency, and reliability uh, and the affordability also of the grid, which is where we get challenged because many of these things will require additional investment. So lots to consider as we think about where the grid has been, where it's going, and how we create a supportive environment for working with customers and going forward with it. And it's interesting, Janine, because the concept you're raising is something that is, been, uh, the term used is energy poverty, where those that can least afford it will have the highest costs of energy if we aren't careful and very disciplined and diligent about how we go about this work. So I'm going to go to the last question, just recognizing how much time we have left. And uh, Andrew, I'll ask you to go first on this one. So the last question is a broader question and you can each approach it uh, however uh, you may choose. It'd be great if you all approached it somewhat differently, different than what uh, a previous panelist might have shared. So what kind of investment framework do we need in Canada to ensure this successful transition that's critical and being driven by climate change to a low carbon, clean energy future? What kind of investment framework? And it may be different depending on if you're private sector or your public sector crown. We'll let you uh, take this one first, Andrew. Sure. Um, and I'm going to cheat a little bit and say, um, I think in our world, I would say the regulatory framework is really where the secret to success, I believe, lies. Um, you know, as, as a crown, you know, it's a difficult question to answer and focus in on the investment framework, per se. Um, but I think to pick up on prior comments and, and just, you know, emphasize them again is, um, you know, our regulators, are, you know, across the country are, are quite a bit behind and, and, it's, and, and it's holding us back, right, in, in creating risk. And so I would argue it's not so much the investment framework that that needs an overhaul, it, it, the high priority would be on the regulatory side. And just, I mean, examples of that would be how to appropriately price in 
uh, carbon. I mean, right now we don't even have that. Our, our, our regulator doesn't recognize the um, any environmental attributes as having value at all. Um, and that's just a really simple example. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Janine, did you want to go next? Um, I guess I just don't have too much to add from my prior comments because I kind of went on my uh, my spiel there. Uh, so, of course, you would have taken uh, from that that, I mean, our, our focus, obviously, as a pure play distribution facility owner and operator is on the opportunities that exist within the regulated tariff, um, much like was just spoken to. And, uh, and we believe that we are well positioned uh, to support uh, the transition to a low carbon clean energy future by working with those communities that we serve every day. So uh, that's primarily been our focus at this point in time. David. Yeah, I, I would say, um, like I said earlier, I, I mean, alignment on the priorities would be first. Uh, so we, we definitely go and make that focus to get the best of, out of the GHG uh, uh, emission would certainly be uh, something. Uh, I think, to, Jay, to go back to one of your point, I think we can definitely work even better uh, uh, towards the Canada line. Uh, we're really working like this instead of working like this sometimes. So definitely to look at the, at different possibilities to help. You know, I was uh, hearing uh, some of my colleagues on the panel saying earlier that, you know, my water was a problem because they had uh, they had uh, too much water. So, and then, uh, and then some area, you know, for us, it's been a... Uh, uh, 10% of normal rain uh, in terms of uh, normal precipitation. So it's, I think there would be opportunities to look and, and, and uh, uh, optimize and work even uh, more together, I would say. Thank you, David and Jose. Yeah, similarly, like I think that the financing that I talked about earlier and and the regulation are are, are quite important. And you know, I I just to come back to the comment earlier uh, uh, on on me talking about future developments and and uh, David talking about existing and 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 optimizing. I, I I fully agree with that as well. I think uh, recognizing the assets that we have and ensuring that to to Andrew's point, we recognize the environmental attributes of existing assets and. And some that, you know, because of the very different regulatory frameworks in different parts of the country, again, operating in different provinces, I, 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 I experienced it in different ways, uh, you know, making sure we recognize that value and, and not forget to, to, you know, there's a lot of investment coming on refurbishments and things like that. So on our existing assets, so not forgetting those as well and being able to uh, uh, recognize the value that those bring. Because if you let just them just become stranded and die off uh, because they're no longer economic then then and you can't refurbish them, then, then that doesn't help us in the long run uh, either. And I guess I'd add a, a, to, to close on that, uh, you know, we're looking very much at Canada here, but I think we have an opportunity as a country because we are uh, our, our, our electricity, electricity system is that much greener than many others in other countries. Uh, we have an opportunity to set a path and, and then to export that expertise to, to other countries and, and uh, show them how it's done and, and support in, in, in those ways as well. Thank you. And, um, you know, I, I think, uh, Andrew, I appreciate that you reframed the question up front because it, it is a broader question. I think what everybody is talking about is that we are an inter that going forward to be successful in creating this new low carbon clean energy future we need to be more integrated and we all have a different role to play when we look at Canada because this is the CEA and um, that framework is not just utilities alone it's not just regulators alone it's federal governments and provincial governments from a policy perspective and the levers and the incentives that they're putting in place. We've seen with the, you know, the, the feds, uh, they're um, investing in infrastructure funding. We've seen the Canada Infrastructure Bank and how active they've been most recently. I believe it was Edmonton and Ottawa that are actually now electrifying their transit fleets with support from CIB. So there's just so many components and a lot of support on the federal side for Indigenous to become self to, uh, independent and self-dependent on generating their own renewable energy and, and the opportunities there. What this says to me though is for us to be successful, the complexity 
but also the opportunities are much greater than they ever have been uh, for our industry in the past. And I, and I often say to, to my team, which is, this is the most exciting time for us to be in this industry. And so I'd like to thank each of our panelists for how you've contributed to the conversation, for sharing your perspectives and for the, for at, at the end of the day, pull it, pulling it together to say, we, we all have a role to play. And it's just, how do we move forward with this? So again, thank you so much for your time. And hopefully uh, members of the symposium, you found this conversation of value and of interest. Um, you know, as Janine said, I think we could have spent all day talking about this because there's just so many facets to it uh, and lots for us more to learn and to mature on to be successful here. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew uh, because he's got a very special announcement and recognition uh, that's going to be made. So thank you to the panelists and thank you to the symposium attendees. Great, thanks Jay, and uh, thank you to you and the rest of the panel for that um, very uh, you know, stimulating and interesting conversation. Um, yeah, so just to wrap things up, as Chair of the Board Committee on Sustainability at CEA, um, I'd like to congratulate two members that have recently achieved the Sustainable, sustainable Electricity Brand designation um, this spring. And so firstly, congratulations to Jason Roberts and Maritime Electric who became our ninth member to achieve the designation. And I believe that Jason joined Francis on an earlier episode of the, the Flux uh, Capacitor podcast series on Earth Day to discuss Maritime Electric's um, focus on sustainability. Um, so Jason's had a chance to speak to that already. Um, but today I'd, I'd um, please to announce that our 10th member joining. So that's Newfoundland Power. Um, who would be uh, formally granted the designation and uh, joining the group. Um, so I think in reviewing uh, Newfoundland Power's um, application, CEA was very impressed with um, various initiatives that um, the organization has uh, you know, undertaken going back almost 20 years. So beginning with their um, first environmental commitment report back in 2001, um, but more recently the establishment, for example, of the uh, a green team in 2018 to enhance, enhance how Newfoundland Power reduces their impacts on the environment and promotes sustainability within the organization. So with that, um, I'll turn things over to Gary Murray, President and CEO at Newfoundland Power. Gary. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, first of all, uh, I just really like to say I enjoyed, enjoyed this symposium this afternoon. Uh, it was very valuable information and uh, insight from the speakers and panelists. Uh, you know, I'm honored to accept the CEA Sustainability Electricity Brand designation on behalf of all of our employees. And at the same time, thank our team for their commitment to sustainability because they're the ones that really earned this. Uh, you know, Newfoundland Power has a long, proud history of delivering safe, reliable, electricity to the people of our province. Uh, we've been doing so now for over 135 years. And as Andrew min mentioned, it was coincidentally, it was almost exactly 20 years ago this month that we've received our ISO 14001 designation. So to be receiving this designation today uh, is certainly very fitting. Uh, you know, we're also very proud to be the second uh, company within the Fortis family to be receiving this designation and the 10th company within, within CEA. Today, you know, our employees, our stakeholders and communities that we serve, they expect us to operate in a socially responsible and sustainable way. And we deliver on that expectation. You know, this designation will show our commitment to sustainability today, as well as into the future. So I'd just like to conclude by thanking CEA and your team for guiding us through this process. And once again, for recognizing Newfoundland Power with the sustainability electricity designation. And I look forward to sharing this uh, exciting information with our team. Well, on behalf of the, the entire CEA team, Gary, congratulations to you. Congratulations to Newfoundland Power on achieving the sustainable electricity designation. Merci à tous ceux qui ont participé au symposium aujourd'hui. 
ceux qui ont pris le temps de se connecter et à nos présentateurs aussi. Les discussions d'aujourd'hui axées sur les problèmes les plus difficiles auxquels le secteur est confronté ont également permis de mettre en lumière l'avenir brillant du secteur. Je tiens également à remercier l'équipe de l'OCE pour, pour tout le travail assidu dans l'organisation de cet événement. C'est à la fois un honneur et un privilège de diriger une équipe aussi créative et dévouée. Thank you to everybody who participated in the symposium today, uh, from those who took the, the time to connect to our presenters and our panelists. You know, the discussion today focused on, on some of the most challenging issues that the sector is facing also served to shine a light on the sector's very bright future. I'd like to thank the CEA team as well for all their diligent work in putting together this event. You know, it's both an honor and a privilege to lead such a creative and such a dedicated team. This brings our, our symposium uh, in this event to a conclusion. Now, mark your calendars for the 2021 annual Powering Partnerships Summit and Awards that's held in conjunction with the fall meeting of the CEA Board of Directors. On November 23rd and 24th, we'll see you in Ottawa. Thank you very much. Have a good day.